I, I don't Lee. agree. Royal Card is one of the biggest uh, logistics company here in the Philippines, and you've been here for 45 years. 45 years. It's a bit more than four decades. Your business, and how, why, why did you start this kind of business? Well, why did I come to the Philippines? Uh, I was very young when I arrived in the Philippines. Uh, I must have been 17 years old at that time, okay? Um, I met my wife when I was 18, and I married her when I was 19. And when I was 20 years old, uh, in the meantime, we were a bit more than a year in Germany. My wife is Filipina, she's uh -huh. from Pakistan Hang. And uh, then after a bit more than one year, we returned to the Philippines, and I started uh, a logistics company. At that time, it was called Forwarding Company, yeah, for German logistics uh, joint venture company. And uh, that was then in uh, 1978, wow. the start of uh, Royal Cargo, actually. Wow. So you have a very rich uh, historical background and a young entrepreneur. You are really adventurous. Uh, why Philippines? Well, <clears throat> I had the choice at that time. When the, when the, when the question came up, uh, how do I get back to uh, to Asia, because I like Asia for a variety of reasons. I don't want to go in details. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so <clears throat> I had the choice in 1975 uh, for a job in Vietnam and in the Philippines. So my wife being Filipina, right, and also uh, for the reason that there was a war in Vietnam, of course I decided happily for the Philippines. Mm. But uh, one of our visions and one of our dreams is we want to recreate a Philippine flag shipping line, container shipping line, wow. which did not exist. When I arrived here in the Philippines, there were two shipping lines, this Philippine flag. And they went to Europe, they went to Hamburg, they went to the United States, mm -hmm. they went to Australia, no, Australia, I'm not sure, but Europe and the uh, United States for sure. It was called Maritima uh, Filipinas. And uh, they had two shipping lines, one domestic and one international. And, uh, but they stopped uh, maybe about 30 years ago. And uh, since, since then there were attempts with special permits of Marina to do some excursions of Philippine uh, container. Uh, there was Eastern shipping lines going to Japan for a while, and there were some other, uh, Aboitis also had some, Madrigal had some uh, activities there. But it was uh, only for short periods of time there, yeah. which is one of the reasons why uh, Philippine importers by at least some shipping lines and from some origins are taken for a ride. So uh, my, uh, our vision is uh, to create a Philippine flag shipping line. Okay, we are operating, uh, we have two uh, CB1100 ships right now here in, uh, in the Philippines. And we have another one in the Mediterranean, which we could bring in as uh, required here, into the uh, intra-ASEAN theater. We are asking for some concessions from uh, Marina to help us do that. It's not money incentives, it's actually regulatory incentives which we are asking to make things easier for us. So, uh, you see, uh, we are not only looking back, we always look also into the future, and we are looking for things to do what, which others are not doing. So I think we are the only one who is doing that right now. However, if Marina would uh, facilitate the, uh, the organization of a Philippine shipping line, that all Philippine ship owners the domestic uh, yes. ship owners can do that. Uh, they may require some help, but it is possible. And you see ASEAN is growing closer yes. and closer together, all right? And uh, in a way you have China, of course, as a big, uh, big elephant in the room, so to speak. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you have ASEAN, but uh, ASEAN, I think, is the future also for the Philippines. Yes. The RCEP. Asset right yes. now also there China is even part of it right yes, and New Zealand. so Asia Asia as uh, as such is uh, is uh, you know very important yes. right even if you look at the population if you con if you would consider uh, a town of uh, 100 uh, people 60 would be Asians <laughs> <laughs> that's, I agree with that right yeah. so uh, and also economically when I started here in the Philippines with freight forwarding uh, logistics. Intra-Asia traffic was basically zero. As you were saying, uh, like the, the traffic of the Asian 
uh, point was uh, zero before, and now it's growing. Almost zero. Yes. Almost zero. There was some interaction in dry Asia as well, but compared to now, it was next to nothing. And now this is a growing, uh, growing market. And uh, you know the country which we should look at, at what they have been doing even in this pandemic and uh, before, and now is Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. But the first time when I went to Vietnam, it was early 90s. And every th thing there looked like East Berlin, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not one, not one print of paint right. on any of the buildings. That's and right. where are they today? So, but it should be an inspiration for us of what is possible if we set our mind to it. You know, before the comparison was Hong Kong and Singapore, but they are small countries, mm -hmm. the small state country, uh, countries, right? So there's no real comparison. But Vietnam is actually a comparison. Sure. Because and they came from nothing. Yes. Remember from boat people. Yes. Uh, seeking shelter amongst others in the Philippines. That's true. Unfortunately, uh, and unf uh, unfortunately, for them, they have uh, actually exceeded the performance of the Philippines right now. And then their strategy is really amazing because, like, uh, the Ho Chi Minh is the industrialized uh, portion of Vietnam, yeah. and in the uh, Hanoi, mm. it's they still preserve the, the agriculture, the, the tourism, etc. Because I was invited in Vietnam before mm. to cover. That's where I met our good friend Alan. Yeah, when he was still working for a French company. And they are also very diversified in their exports. Yes. The Philippines, when I arrived here, was more diversified than it is right now. I mean, the primary export of the Philippines is direct and indirect labor. Yeah. And some agricultural products. But uh, Vietnam was able to uh, basically uh, turn around from a very poor country to world leaders in the export of agricultural products. And, uh, now, and, and now also electronics. Right. So uh, maybe we can look and see and adopt some of the strategies they de developed over the past ten years. For our, I don't want to put down my adopted uh, yes. country here, you know? I know. right? Because uh, look, I mean, uh, I, I told you when I arrived here, I was uh, 20 years old for business. I was here before to get married, but when I <laughs> arrived here yeah. for business, I was 20 years uh, years old. So for me. Only a very short part of my life, I'm now 66 years old, I spent in Germany. The rest I spent here in the Philippines. So obviously I adopted to the Philippines. Yes. Yes. And I'm longer in the Philippines than two-thirds of all Filipinos. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that, we, that you can certainly say. What, what do you think uh, the Philippines should be doing uh, as far as these opportunities like Vietnam? assist and other ASEAN neighbors assist. If, if you were to make that kind of suggestion or strategy, what would that be? Well, let me put it like that. Uh, on a positive note, yes. the Philippines saw it fit to create ARTA, anti-red yeah, tape, yeah. right? Red, and you have seen my other calling card, no? yes. uh, as uh, co-chair of the Integrity Initiative Inc., right? Which is by and large, a commitment of the business, yeah, right, right, uh, yes. not to invite to the tango of bribery, yeah, because there are always two to tango. I so agree. the uh, the business side has, uh, which are part and parcel of the uh, of uh, integrity initiative, has has pledged to do something about it and not bribe, yeah, right. So when it comes to red tape, it is very often a corruption enabler. It has no other purpose but corruption and aiding. So uh, these two things are the primary uh, issues which we have to address to really progress. Right? Less corruption, less red tape. So technology would be able to help this lessen the, the yes, steps, yes. the minute steps. Yes, I'm also actually I'm a governor uh, of the MSGC, Multisectoral Governance Group of the Bureau of Customs. So I'm one of only two foreigners who are there, oh. and, and we are working with our uh, you know, comrades in, in, uh, in customs uh, to reform, you know, to improve. There is a World Bank uh, loan for that uh, purpose, and uh, customs now makes an effort to be ISO certified, yeah. and, uh, and it has also made pledges uh, to fight corruption. Now, but uh, let's not, uh, you know, 
uh, let's not pretend that that is possible uh, from today to tomorrow. Uh, it requires a lot of work, it requires a lot of dedication. But uh, in one of the last uh, interviews uh, we had, uh, discussions uh, we had, uh, I was uh, heartened by one statement that now the Bureau of Customs uh, officials are not ashamed of uh, having the badge of Bureau of Customs when they go out and they meet with friends and when they meet with business leaders. Uh, because there is a serious effort for improvement. So in the whole of the Philippines, there should be that effort. Uh, and I'm sure that it is not only in the Bureau of Customs, but also in other areas where attempts are made to, uh, to do that. Once that is overcome, red tape and corruption, the next thing is to have the courage to diversify or to re-diversify yes. again and uh, regain some of the uh, some of the fields which were given up already. Yeah, in including, uh, uh, I mean, as far as uh, as far as electronics is concerned, uh, maybe more of the old spirit of PESA, yeah. right? Uh, not fashion uh, PESA. Uh, I was asked about a half year ago, you know, what I consider the biggest uh, threat. Uh, to the Philippine economy, and uh, my opinion during that time was, uh, if if the PESA construct is put in question, right? I know in the meantime uh, there is no such threat anymore. I think now the situation is very clear with respect to uh, taxation. I think a lot of it has been done in dialogue with SAIP and mm -hmm. other uh, other institutions, but the time of the uncertainty cost a lot. Sure. Because in the time of the uncertainty, people, uh, companies rethought their investment in the Philippines and some of them even left the Philippines. So this needs to be urgently uh, revised. And then uh, agriculture has to be uh, or should be uh, promoted, yes, should, be, right. should be helped. Yes. Because uh, if you look at the age of the average farmer, 50 plus, 56 or yeah, seven yeah, years right, old. Right. Yeah. And then also the methodology has to uh, has to change. Uh, there are new Philippines invented Masagana ninety nine, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That's right? Right. But uh, what about coconuts? What about mangoes? What about uh, new freezing uh, technologies, yeah. which uh, you know retain the, the Plus taste? freezing. Yeah. Uh, it's also uh, individual quick freeze, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. IQF. IQF, yeah. IQF. Japan is doing These that. things should be yes, promoted. You know, right. let's think forward. Let's, you know, there are a lot of opportunities. There are some, uh, some uh, problems, and each of these problems is an opportunity to do it better. Yes. So for every lot, there is a key. Of course. Yes. Of right. course. Well, yes. wow. I think on that regard, you'd be able to help uh, the, the, the country, the exporters. The, I also agree with you, Mike, as far as agriculture is concerned. In fact, uh, I wrote a piece about that in the Philippine Business and News. We, we, we see that agriculture will be the one to save our country as far as economy because we have vast lands here in the Philippines unused. And uh, we have, as one of the Japanese persons that I interviewed, our method is a bit obsolete compared to, to what, what should be adopting right now. Yeah, that is correct. That's absolutely correct. Uh, it's uh, on, the, on one side, it's agriculture, and on the other side, a huge opportunity is in the minerals. Mm -hmm. The Philippines is one of the most mineralized countries on earth. True. And it is, I totally agree that uh, we have to be very careful on uh, damages to the environment by mining. And there have been a lot of bad incidences in Australia and in other countries. So we should be very careful not to repeat that. But on the other side, not to do it, not to uh, harvest the wealth of the nation, uh, because we are afraid of, uh, of uh, envi environmental damage. Mm -hmm. The question should be, uh, we should uh, avoid, uh, we should regulate, we should police the uh, mining companies, not, uh, not to do damage to the environment, but uh, harvest the opportunities of the country as far as uh, mining is concerned as well. Which is the other big uh, opportunity? Yes. Sustainable mining. Exactly. Yeah, one of the mining uh, projects in uh, in Mindanao would have put us into the top rank of gold and uh, and copper export in the world. Yeah, and it could have been a game changer actually. Wow.